Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attendance this morning. I'm pleased to be joined by so many well-respected chefs, members of Chicago's restaurant industry, and public health experts this morning. They have one very important message for the United States Congress, and that is ban the use of non-therapeutic antibiotics in the production of livestock. I strongly believe that citizens need to know more about how and why antibiotics are used on food animals to produce meat and poultry. The relationship between antibiotic use in food animals and antibiotic resistant infections in people is something that all Americans should learn about. Prior to the discovery of antibiotics, something as simple as a cut or a scrape could turn deadly if it became infected. Today, however, these antibiotic miracle drugs are being overused at an alarming rate, particularly on industrial farms. The overuse of these antibiotics in livestock has become extremely dangerous to humans, creating something known as superbugs, which represent a grave and unnecessary risk to public health. Today, we will conduct a hearing to discuss the proposed resolution because it is hoped that many other cities around the country will join in urging the Congress to act on this important issue. I'd like to save the details for the experts, so I'd like to now introduce Dr. Chowkar, the Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health, and his colleague, Dr. Stephanie Black, to discuss the threat of antibiotic-resistant bacteria to human health. Doctor? Thank you, uh, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Black, for joining me. Um, you know, when you engage public health officials about um, on the topic of emerging threats, uh, antibiotic resistance comes nearly at the top of everyone's list. Antibiotics have been a saving grace for our field for decades, literally saving millions of lives um, throughout the years. And in fact, antibiotics treatments are up there with sanitation systems for the great leaps our society has made in protecting the health of our public. Truth be told, some antibiotic resistance occurs naturally, but the growing use and misuse of antibiotics accelerates the emergence of strains that are resistant to antibiotics. We often hear about the problem of prescribing and using antibiotics when they are not needed, which is one way antibiotic resistance uh, starts. The misuse of antibiotics on our food supply, as we are talking about today, deserves equal attention. Why? In 2011, 80% of all antibiotics sold by weight in this country were used on livestock. 80% of all antibiotics used, uh, sold by weight were used on livestock. And because of that, 7.3 million pounds of antibiotics were used to treat humans compared to 29.9 million pounds sold for meat and poultry production. As part of our testimony today, a little bit later at City Council, we'll discuss how this widespread use is resulting in more antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And this is a real issue, and that's why I'm glad the City of Chicago is showing real readership in addressing it. In 2012, more than 300,000 children at the Chicago Public Schools began eating fresh chicken drumsticks from local farms that raise their poultry without antibiotics. And this past school year, the, the district's program provided students with over 2.7 million servings and 690,000 pounds the safer chicken. Today, we are joining all of our colleagues to call on the federal government to do the same and take the lead on this important issue. And I look forward to our conversation later today at City Council together with my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Black. Thank you. I'm uh, proud to represent the Green Chicago Restaurant Coalition, co-founded with Dan Rosenthal, and this sampling of extraordinary chefs and restaurateurs, and to thank Alderman Burke for taking the lead to have Chicago join with other cities like Seattle and Cleveland, Madison, St. Paul, to urge the Congress to pass PAMTA. Chicago's restaurant community has always led the way with social issues that affect everyone. In 2005, we organized chefs and restaurateurs to help pass the smoking ban. 
Today we are united to fight the abuse of antibiotics by industrial meat producers. When we suit up every day, it's a clear commitment to serve safe and healthy food in a safe and healthy environment. We see and act on the future. Our eyes are always focused on where the puck is going. Here are the witnesses who will inform the Finance Committee about our mission and will be available to answer your questions before we go in to the chamber. You will hear from Dr. Stephanie Black. Um, she's been a medical director in the Communicable Disease Program at the Chicago Department of Public Health since 2008. And she's giving advice on pandemic preparedness efforts and emerging infectious diseases. You will hear Evelyn Macario. She's armed with a doctorate in public health from Harvard and never heard of MRSA until she understood that it was the cause of her otherwise healthy son's death. You have a very important person to listen to on that. Um, Susan Boyle Vavra. Um, Susan is the director of MRSA Research Central Laboratory. A major goal of her research is to understand how pathogens such as MRSA affect and develop into resistant antibiotics. Susan Vaughn Gruders. She will provide background on the status of federal legislation of PAMTA and discuss the need for urgency in passing the legislation. You will hear from Dr. David Bain, who is a PhD and veterinarian and a rancher. Hi. Um, and will speak to the realities of raising farm animals for food production without antibiotics and how such a change is possible in large scale animal production. So we are ready for your questions if you have any. And if not, we will go right into city council hearing and we will begin to push our mission forward. If you take a look at this, 23,000 people are in the amount of people who died from antibiotic resistant MRSA in, in 2011. 23,000 people. Why hasn't Congress passed? Well, we're going up against the lobbyists, which probably put $100 million into opposing it. And so here we are. You know, I felt uh, our creator gave us a neck, and I think it's time to stick it out, don't you? Well, you know, the same people who say that say there's no such thing as global warming. So there's plenty of evidence. We have it all here. We have it all here. You ask any of the doctors about what it costs us to have people in hospital. We had how many? Eight million days of extra hospitalization for people with MRSA. This is a really serious issue. You know, as, as the demand is bigger for ABF, so does the production scale up. I can buy an antibiotic-free chicken for $1.99 a pound. That's the same as you can get it at the Juul if it's a highly processed meat. So there's no big differential any longer. You can find what you need. Why don't you see if there's any other questions? Of, uh, well, sure. You become resistant because you are ingesting antibiotics with every bit of factory farmed protein that you eat. So little by little, you begin to get a resistance. And so when your doctor prescribes an antibiotic that you may need and it doesn't work, they may have to go to a stronger one and yet another stronger one. Well, look how many years we have been eating it. It's hard to know. We have to stop right now. It's very hard to know. And you know, before you, you get on to Alderman Burke and we're all on his side with this, the point of it is when Alderman Burke comes out of surgery and needs antibiotics, we have to be sure that they work on Aunt Alderman Burke. So this is really a, an issue that has relevance this week. This is Dr. Stephanie Black and with the Chicago Department of Public Health Communicable Disease Program. And I just wanted to add that the bacteria that contain resistant genes can transfer those genes 
to our own bacteria in our guts. So that is the medical uh, way that the resistance transfers. Once the meat is consumed, that is how we can develop drug-resistant infections. Why don't you stay right in here? Sure. So bacteria develop resistance through genes, and bacteria are actually very promiscuous and can swap genes with each other, and that can happen even within the same host. So while you may have, say, an E. coli in your gut, if you eat meat that contains a different bacteria that has a resistance gene, once that enters your body, the gene can then swap into your own bacteria. So you're saying that the manner of cooking has nothing to do with this transplant? No, cooking appropriately can kill the bacteria, but that means that meat needs to be cooked to temperatures that kill off that bacteria. Do they kill off the flavor too? Is that what you're getting at? Then? No, I'm not getting at that. Potentially, yes, right. So all raw meat needs to be cooked to the appropriate temperature before consumption, and also there needs to be, as all these chefs know, very careful procedures in not placing that raw meat in contact with raw vegetables. So even properly cooked meats that have come from uh, animals that have been bred in factory farms with destruction and other cancer, if they're, even if they are cooked, you, they need to be talking about them. Is there still a risk of the transference of, the, of, the, uh, of, of whatever it is that's causing the most as long as the meat is handled properly, then the cooking should kill off bacteria, including resistant bacteria. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Boyle Vaver from the University of Chicago, um, doctor as in PhD. Um, so I just wanted to add to um, what Dr. Black said, which is that um, we have to worry also about contamination of surfaces. And as we handle the meat, we can actually contaminate our own um, nasal passages, and then we become colonizers of these antibiotic resistant strains, which we th can then pass on to people who haven't handled the meat, such as our children. Um, and so we have to worry about uh, the contaminated surfaces and how that gets passed around with the family as well. Um, and yes, I agree, you know, if you cook your meat, you're fine, but uh, these bacteria have a way of creeping into crevices in your cutting boards and things like that. Um, who was in charge here of uh, the government? There we are. We always go to the experts. Can you repeat your question so other people can hear it? Well, what it does is it limits the use of eight antibiotics that are critically important in human medicine. So it preserves those antibiotics for use in humans and eliminates use for healthy animals. Um, it, you can, pardon me, it will allow use in healthy, uh, so with animals that are sick, there's still an ability to use those antibiotics in those, but it basically preserves antibiotics for treatment of human um, health conditions. And um, do you think this will affect the government passing it? Oh, I, I think it'll be, it'd be, it'd be fantastic. If, if, we can, if we can get the groundswell from city councils across the nation to help support the federal legislation, it could really help what's happening in D.C. right now. It's, it's essential that they hear from other people, not just inside the Beltway in D.C. Sure, I'm Susan Von Groters. I'm with Keep Antibiotics Working. We're a coalition of 11 million members nationwide, and we've been working on this issue of preserving antibiotics for uh, human health for, uh, uh, gosh, more than 20 years now. So. Yep, I'll talk about the preservation of antibiotics for medical yeah, treatment. Just briefly explain, where is that process right now? Is there any hope of federal legislation coming through soon? Well, there's always hope. So it has co-sponsorship. Uh, Congresswoman Louise Slaughter is who introduced it. She is the only microbiologist in Congress, and she has been working on this issue for a number of years. Uh, she has broad support. There is also uh, PARA, um, which is in the Senate side. If those two bills can come together and get passed, it would do a, an enormous amount of good because it has a weight behind it um, with legislation that's different from regulation. And so the legislation is, is really essential and very important. Is the pharmaceutical industry fighting this? 
uh, big ag and big pharma are surprisingly uh, not on board with this. Uh, I, I don't know why. I can't quite figure that one out. Yeah, there's an economic incentive certainly um, to, for feed efficiency and growth promotion um, as opposed to health prevention. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when I scheduled this, I didn't believe I was going to be uh, talking to you about my own personal health issue. But several weeks ago during a routine physical, it was discovered that my PSA level was elevated. Further tests revealed that like hundreds of thousands of other men, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I've opted for a surgical treatment which will be performed on Thursday. With faith in God and trust in my doctors, I'm confident of full recovery. After a period of recuperation, I expect to be able to return to a normal schedule. My family and I are grateful for the many messages of support and prayer from friends and well-wishers. My experience is an example of why men should receive PSA testing. Now I trust that you will respect my privacy as I deal with this health issue. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. It means the world to us that you came here to. Uh, to yes, absolutely. <laughs> Cost is definitely, cost does um, add a challenge to the customer, but at the same time, customers do seek out restaurants that are, um, that do want to use farmers that they can rely on, meat that they know uh, what's been done to it, and then it's the same responsibility that we that we accept by, uh, farm, by uh, using the Green City Market, which basically, <clears throat> there's a set of values that are set and that we use as, as a, say, a, a moral a moral guide for, for how we want to produce our food. Uh, yeah, there we go.